I'm Britton Trice with Garden District Bookshop, and I'd like to welcome everybody this evening. Uh, it's our distinct pleasure to have uh, Reese Fuller here, along with our author, Deej Leg. And this is, uh, we're here to celebrate the publication of Deej's new book, The Cab Log. Um, great stories, by the way. Uh, really enjoy, really enjoying the ones that I've read. Uh, and you're not, you're not still driving, are you? You still? No way, man. No way. <laughs> I was done in 2008. That was a, you know, it, it probably took a few years off my life. Right. That job, so, but I have thought about it. You never know, man, with this. Uh, hey, if we keep on lockdown like this, I might be driving a cab next year. So who knows? But anyway, we're here to celebrate uh, Deesha's new book. And uh, for y'all, those of you who don't know, uh, first of all, Reese uh, Fuller is a journalist and author of a prior book, uh, Angola to Zydeco, published by University Press of Mississippi, uh, came out uh, about 2011. And Deej, we have a little, Deej is a Grammy nominated musician. He's uh, got a, a piece in Dangjo Dang Unchained, the original soundtrack. And an award-winning writer, born and raised in Southern Louisiana. In addition to driving a cab, he has a BA in philosophy has worked as a cook, a caseworker, and a homeless shelter in order to support his artistic compulsions. And he writes music records and tours the US and Europe with his band, Brother Deej and the Brethren. So you can visit him at brotherdeej.net. So as we go along, uh, if people have questions, they can type them into the chat room. Uh, the chat button button is down at the bottom of most most places is the bottom of the menu of the zoom menu and i'm also going to post uh, a link to, to people to order books uh goes direct to our website so if you haven't gotten the book feel free to click that link and uh, order it up so anyway i'm going to turn the floor over to uh hear more about the book so guys take it away Appreciate it. Hey, so uh, we are coming to you live from uh, Deej's Germ Warfare Lab here in Lafayette. Uh, this is one of the toxic mutant flies that we just killed. Uh, in the full, uh, in the interest of a full disclosure, Deej and I have known each other for several years. Uh, yeah, over a dec two decades, dude. I know. I was trying to figure it out. So probably 2001. -ish. Yeah. Right. So we've, we know each other for a very, very long time. I've had the uh, privilege of interviewing him before and talking to him before. We have a tendency in our conversations to be very long winded, which are fun and fun. <laughs> and it makes for a lot of uh, rumor and conjecture and uh, uh, cussing and laughing. inside notes and inside notes. But yeah. but I've actually uh, written questions down this time so that hopefully in the interest of uh, our time format, we can kind of move through this. Um, but uh, DJ and I met through Tony Daigle probably in 2001 when he was in the band Santa Rhea working on House of the Dying Sun, right? Correct. Tony's a Grammy-winning uh, producer from this area, Dr. John, B.B. King, Son, uh, Sonny Landreth, et cetera. And so we, uh, I ended up doing a news article on him there, and then uh, when they were in Santa Rhea, I want to talk about the dissolving of Santa Rhea, how that kind of comes to this point with catalog. I'm jumping around really quickly because the first thing I want to talk about with Cablog is that I think that what you've done extremely well, um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, uh, you do, a, as one who has worked the night shift as well, I think you do a fascinating job of uh, nailing the whole vibe of, of life at night. Yep. You know what Alan Toussaint calls the night people, like everybody's waiting for something to happen, right? Yeah. And I think you do an incredible job of um, nailing that. How, for like folks who, how is the night person different than the average working daytime stiff? Jekyll and Hyde, buddy. Jekyll and Hyde. Like, as soon as the sun goes down, shit changes, man. Like, it really pops off. I work the day shift. The day shift is kids going to school, right. moms going to their work, uh, dropping their kids to uh, groceries. Nighttime is like drunks, drugs, uh, prostitutes, guys wanting to party, knuckleheads. It's all it's all the above, but there's a big difference. Even the same people during the day might be relatively composed during the daytime, but as soon as the night goes down, you know, after ten, it gets it gets wicked. You know, yeah. like alcohol 
drugs, all that stuff does a, a lot of numbers on people's personalities, their dispositions. I think it's also not, just not seeing the sun. And after a oh, yeah. while, you it's, just you're, you're cloaked stressed. in the darkness, yeah. so you can do more things. You could steal something, and people wouldn't see you doing this. Right, it, it wouldn't be as apt to see you doing it in the daytime. It's, yeah. it, it's, and that goes across the board. That scales throughout the colossus of the night. And so then, so let's back up to the beginning of this. You get before you when you get a job uh, with Dixie. It's Dixie Cab, huh? correct? Dixie City. They yeah, Dixie City, same thing. So when you get a job with them, what? Was Santa Maria, was it basically fizzling out at the time? Uh, had y'all, where were you in the process? Yeah. Because you, at the beginning, you talked about finding yourself in a hotel room. And I'm trying to, I was trying to place that like historically. What okay. Was well, the band had, uh, for, for all practical purposes, my old band Santa Maria, which had been together 10 years, had fizzled out. We did a, a tour uh, to the West Coast and, you know, one guy, two guys were getting engaged. Another guy was getting married. And uh, that was it, you know, and it was tiring. We didn't never made any money. Yeah. So it was pretty much like we had a little band meeting actually in Houston, Texas at the last show. And it was like, you know, one of the main guys in the band, Primo, who's my good brother was like, hey man, I don't think this is for me, you know? And I remember that to this day. And I was like, okay, well without Primo, I don't think this is gonna go on. He's, he was a big part of the band. Yeah. And so that fizzled out. Uh, it literally fizzled out in 2004 when the drummer got in a big car accident and broke his legs. Right. But that, that. that, that kind of put the last nail in the coffin for any kind of reunion. So, yeah, so I was, that, that was it. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I was always recording and writing music and I just happened to be living in motels because my previous living situation fell apart. It was uh, this other person's house. And, you know, I got to go. Right. So I didn't have money to buy a new, uh, to, to, to rent a new place for a deposit first last month. So I just moved into these motels, which I was already kind of interested in anyway. I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, it's like I was you know, young, you know, young enough at the time to where it didn't feel like I was a loser. So uh, I was doing that, but I also needed a job yeah. and need to figure my shit out and kind of figure out the next chapter. And so... You know, when you think about like undercover journalism, a lot of these guys like Ted Conover, you know, they, they would they would take a job to write about it. But I see your situation differently. You're kind of more, you're more like it's more like, you know, DIY dishwasher Pete kind of thing. Like you needed a gig. You needed a job. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's basically I need to find a job right now. And this is what I got. Right. I didn't have the career yet. The, right. I was still hustling in the in the work in the working world. So when I would work, I would just try to flip whatever I was doing into some kind of uh, creative exercise, whether right. it be completely boring where I'm composing or music in my head or something. But the cab, it was obvious. I mean, as soon as I walked in the front door, met the boss to interview, he was a character right away. Very interesting guy, Joe Youssef. And then I met like a few of the cab drivers as I'm coming out for shift change. Right. They're, they're going to work. And I'm like, I knew I was going to write about it right away. Did you know it was going to be in the format that it was? No. We kind of, because I'd already been establishing that format with the band Santa Maria. I was already doing a thing called Road Log, which is a, a tour journal of all the stuff that happens to bands in between gigs. Right. So I'd already kind of been chipping away at the ice of this format. Cab Log definitely solidified it because I'd been blogging it online. And the quickest way, the one of the things I didn't like about reading online is having to scroll all the way across the page. So I started making everything in a skinny column, right? You know, almost like poetry, but not poetry. But so you could just speed read through it and just scroll with your mouse, and that became the format. In addition to me also writing in the margins along my log sheet of where the destinations were, I kind of scribbled notes about the interesting passengers, and that kind of contributed to the economy of the language as well as the format. And so how then does it end up, because I remember you posting those online, and how then did it get to the point at the time, I believe Scott Jordan was the editor of The Independent, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was editor by that point. By the way, Scott Jordan is the author of The Forward, and I think I saw his name over here. Saying, Scott oh, Jordan. Oh yeah, blacked out here. He's got a camera. Uh, he he's a badass, man. Exactly. I mean, like, he, those guys are really smart. Just a side note, Scott, Reese, all these guys I went to work with, at the independent eventually they're super smart like i was kind of like a like a world war ii guy that'd been on an island for 
20 years and didn't know the war was over. And then they brought me into the office to work and uh, I was rangy, you know, but it was cool being around smart guys. But Scott wrote the forward. Mm -hmm. He was editor of the independent. And I just on a whim, I'd known him previously because he'd written about my old band and right. I was a fan of his writing, to be honest, and respected him. So I just pitched him an idea by email. I was like, Scott, man, I've been doing this job, driving a cab. How about I write? Uh, I got a little piece set up, some kind of stuff going on. And I think I sent him a sample and he wrote back and he was like, dude, I love this. And uh, let's come, come into the office and show me what you got and let's work on it. We'll see if we can make it happen. And he did. So that was kickoff. And so I remember the I remember when that article came out. Man, so many years ago. What was it? It wasn't two thousand. I mean, what was uh, two thousand four? June two thousand four, right? So when it came out, I remember it, the format was not not to get too bogged down in semantics, but the format was closer to kind of internet style. But we still kind of made Correct. accommodations for like it was still know, AP kind of right. uh, perfect margins and yeah. And there was some tweaking and, you know, the, each place that the cab for each format, for example, the column format looks weird on the page. Right, right. Like right. it looks better on the internet than it does on the page, namely because of uh, dialogue. When you have to keep returning dialogue and then putting the quotation marks down here, it just, it looks yeah. odd. So I kind of, the, the book form has a hybrid of the two, almost right. like experimental prose. Were you able to, uh, so was, were you able to get out an entry just about every day while you were working uh, and driving the cab? Or is that too, uh, you know what? Or did you try to? Maybe least? like one a night. And then I try to get one a night, like one good one. Sometimes you'd get six in a night, but <laughs> sometimes it would be one in a night and you couldn't catch, or it'd be, you couldn't catch them all in a garbage bag. Like they're just flying at you because it's <laughs> some of those crazy nights. But at the, as I kind of mentioned in a previous interview, when I got finished with the job, it was an 800 page word file. It was just, it was massive, it was huge. And I had to weed through all that stuff because some of it didn't age well. Some of it, I didn't really, uh, some of the, some of the, in, the, the, the stories I didn't have really a whole lot of insight into. Some of these that are in the book, I don't have insight into. You'll see them just kind of trail off and it's kind of, kind of left hanging in the air. But I tried to leave the ones that I had a good, kind of punchline to it at the end and has some just I don't know but some of them didn't age well obviously six you know four or five hundred pages of it didn't age well to me it just needed to be cut out what do you mean by that I mean what do you mean it didn't age well for you what does that mean for you internet because I uh, because I've been blogging it there's a thing there's a thing that happens when you write for the internet is you kind of get chatty with your audience yeah so I noticed like, I'm like, who the fuck am I talking to when I go back and revise this five, six years later and try to get it down to a manageable form. Right. I'd be like, I sound like I'm talking to the audience rather than just I'm a standalone author writing on the page. So I tweak some of those, but you know, some of, some of it just didn't age well. I don't, I don't know. Well, and I, that also maybe it wasn't interesting, you know, not well, everything makes the cut. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you say. I mean, like the different format, that, that kind of, you know, breezy style that generally hits with, on the blog, you know, a blog would generally kind of have that. It doesn't, I don't find it that it's real, it's interesting though. I don't find that kind of breeziness here. I do find it conversational, but I find it far more controlled than that, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's, it, you know what I'm saying? It's not like it's it, uh, it's not like hey, this is a crazy thing to happen to me. Even though, even though there's crazy things happening. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, and maybe I cut out some of the conversation, uh, some of the kind of the uh, the caddy. I don't yeah, know yeah. what it is, know you know. You but uh, the the the, uh, the the entries that that stood the test of time really stuck out, and the ones that were kind of middle road or not worthy just kind of got pushed to the side. There There's probably like maybe I'd say a dozen that could have made the book, but we're like, you know, 50 50. Okay, so that's that. I'm just curious. What are some of the what's one of those that you could tell now that doesn't make the book that for some yeah. reason it just doesn't translate? <laughs> <laughs> or is there even one for public consumption? I mean, <laughs> some of it's a little, you know, in C17, there was one cab driver in my cab who he was getting off work early. So a lot of the cab drivers didn't even have cat cars. Right. So they'd call you, to, hey, come pick up driver 14 and drive him home. So you drive back to the cab stand, pick up this driver. This guy, who's cool as shit, 
I pick him up and he's like, hey man, we gotta make a stop. We make a stop at apartment complex. All of a sudden it's him and a chick in the backseat and we're going to her place, not his place. And then all of a sudden, you know, five minutes later, I see like his, the, the silhouette of his back going up and down in the rearview mirror, almost like a whale at night in the moonlight. And he's having sex with his, his lady friend, you know what I mean? And it was, it was funny and it's cool, but I, I didn't, whatever it was in the entry, just, I didn't like, uh, it wasn't that great of a story. It was just a guy yeah. having sex in the back of the cab. And you couldn't tell him no cracking cat. No. Viet, the Vietnam guy, Vietnamese guy, or the Asian guy was just great. He was funny. And that was one of my, that was during my first year. Right. No cracking cap. No cracking cap. Right. Y'all had to establish yeah. the rapport that that was the rule. No crack in the cap. Yeah. And he was really trying to work me right. like, hey, no, <laughs> you don't understand. I smoke the crack. You don't have to do the, you know what I mean? No, no, just, you don't understand. I, you just can't do yeah, this. Yes. Like, he was, he's a character, man. I, I remember him like it was yesterday. You were talking about, there's a, there's a couple of occasions you talk about, it comes up time and time again about drunken people wanting to shake hands. What do you think that's about? I don't know. I think it, your inhibitions obviously get lowered. So, and you're in a, in a car with a stranger. So you're wanting, I think people, humans instinctively want to connect with one another. They yeah. don't want to, they don't want separation and all that stuff. So when they get drunk, they just kind of want to shake your hand all the time and, and do it multiple times. Like, I don't know why. This happens even, I'm a musician, I'm at shows and I get a really drunk guy and he's just, dude, yeah, oh, man. Right, 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 right. Like COVID time, maybe that's not happening now, dude. But that happens a whole lot. You know, I don't know why, but they want to connect physically. And that's a kind of common doable way to do it, I guess. Um, you said that another part, another thing I wrote down, one of the lines I loved was that dealing with drunks is like babysitting monsters. Why, why, is, why is it an occupational hazard for the, the person to even to fall asleep? I find that that to me is fascinating. Like that's a, that's a huge problem, right? Like if you're driving somebody home who's nodding off to sleep, yeah. Uh, you and I talked about this years ago. You, you, talk, you called that technique where you explain the technique. Shake and bake or shake yeah. and wake. Yeah, did you tell me once about this technique about when, when you're driving home? Drunk people in the cab that pass out in the back seat. And what happens is you get to their destination and you have to kind of touch them physically or if it's a female, that's there's all kind of problems that open up when somebody passes out. Even if it's a guy, like maybe he accuses you of robbing him or he doesn't know where he's at, or I already paid you. Like it's, it just opens a big can of worms. So you always try to keep the passenger awake. And what I did was I started developing a technique where I just start like uh, jerking the steering wheel back and forth, calling it like a shake and wake so that they would just kind of keep bobbling in the back seat and not fall asleep and, you know, further screw my night up. And uh, and if you're the parents of small children, the shake and wake works too. I mean, it ends up looking like like the cops are seeing this happening. And it looks like I'm the drunk guy driving, you know. <laughs> In order to keep them awake, just kind of tug the wheel just a little bit, or just tap the brake really quickly. That'll kind of uh, work out with them. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about uh, the one arm guy. Does the one arm guy is he? Uh, he comes up several times in the book. Would you say that, was he? I mean, he certainly is in the book, but was he your most constant fare? He, no, but he was kind of the MB, MVP of the regulars. Right. Like he was just interesting in a weird cocky manner that I found intriguing. You know, he's kind of a prick, but he was sort of funny in his prickness and he was missing an arm, you know, which is kind of entertaining. And, and this is a real guy. Like uh, I had somebody that read the book recently and he's and, and who texted me and said, uh, dude, I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So what? I haven't seen him since the cab days. And, and I, I guarantee you in the next three or four months, I see him like in, in the grocery store. Yeah, I right, bet you. Right. That's how the universe works. Do you run into folks uh, from cab days it in was, the daytime? You know what? I don't remember. I mean, things change a lot in the 10, 12 years that I did that. So. I do run, I run into uh, employees. Like I'll, I'll see the boss now and then I'll see other ex drivers. There's even guys driving the cab now that worked with me back then. I saw one guy on the street downtown and then he's like, yo, D, what's up? Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> it's like, that's cool, man. I love that. You know, 
they called me number four. That was my driver. Like, what's up, number four? <laughs> <laughs> Out in public, and you know it exactly what they're yeah. saying. So, what does um, there was something else I wanted to ask you about uh, the one armed guy? So, if he is so so you do know who he is but you haven't ran into him outside mm -hmm. um looking back on all those i, I kind of find it fascinating that all of these folks are you know that was some of these funny some of these stories are really 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 funny man like just laugh out loud funny because i can't imagine being in that situation and like kind of keeping it together some of them are extremely heartbreaking um, and I think I think the, what's heartbreaking is just the story themselves, but it's also the way that you present it. Um, uh, and what I'm really curious about is how how are you keeping track of how are you making notes of this as you're going? I know you got your book there, and I know you're writing the fares down. And I don't want to talk this, about this in a second. Why Lafayette doesn't have meters? But how are you keeping track of? Um, and I know it's, I know you're not taking, you know, exactly word for word what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. But like, how are I'm you absorbing it? Yeah. I mean, like, how are you sitting there? Like, are you sitting at the red light going, man, I need to write this down now? Or are you waiting until your, your, you know, how does that work? This is pre cell phone, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean your cell phone, but it's pre smartphone. Right. So you're still tech. It just, you know, calls and texts. At that time, I mean, it's already a juggling act. You're multitasking like a motherfucker already in the cab. Like you're making change for people. It was a cash business. There were no credit cards at the time. Right. So you're making change and driving, looking at the next fare or the destination and dealing with the personality in the backseat of the cab and navigating the roads and the, you know, the idiots on the road sometimes, right. you know, so what was the question? <laughs> Basically, how are you keeping track of it to know like oh. that's that's that? Are, are you so are you? I don't know. I've always night? had a gift for like uh, you know. I'm not a. I mean, I'm a journalist, but more in the kind of soft sense. But right. I've always been able to kind of absorb. Uh, I don't know. I've got a tape recorder in my head. I kind of like I can absorb dialogue. I can feel it. I can't hold it for longer than two or three days. But if I write it down the next day, I can. I can translate it, you know, roughly to maybe 90% accuracy. Right. But, and I'll make, I'd make notes. If specifically when I drop somebody off, I would make a note about them where uh, their, their particular ride. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I still have these cab journals too, man. They're in a box at my mom's house. And I even thought about screenshotting and taking some pictures and maybe I'll doing that as a form of promo, but. So out of all those 800 pages and all the journals, how do we get all this? How, how do you say like, this is, this is what's going on. This is, these are the ones that I'm going to let go. And are, do you have intentions of, you know, the sequel? Is there some, are there others that like you wanted? But for some <laughs> like reason, the uncensored yeah, version. Right, right. I thought about that. Like maybe like a, like a, What's it called when somebody really re-releases a book and it's got like extra chapters in it? Yeah, maybe like a box set later, or you're like you know, unfinished recordings or something. I mean, bonus chapters or yeah, something right, like that. I thought about chapter. that, like maybe putting the more really kind of like darker, weirder shit in yeah. there. I thought about that. I mean, to, to answer your question, it was it took 45 revisions to get it down from eight hundred pages. Like it took a lot of work, and I had some help with uh, Hunter S. Thompson's. The guy, the, the woman who edited Hunter S. Thompson's Hell's Angels, uh -huh. a buddy of mine referred me to her and I wrote her, I was like, hey, would you be interested in kind of uh, taking a first edit at this book? And she did. She gave me, you know, wow, notes great. and stuff like that. Yeah. Margaret Harrell is her name, if you want to Google her. So the first uh, editor of Cab Log is Margaret Harrell, who edited Hunter S. Thompson's Hell's Angels. And then I had my girlfriend help me uh, edit some stuff. I get her to read it. I just kept chopping, man. I knew it was too long. I could imagine it being 300, 350 pages. But even as I, when you read your own book, like I don't know how many damn times, you get bored with it. You, you start know. seeing where the dead air is. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You, and you do, you know, and maybe there's some dead air left in there, but it's a nice breather from the pow, pow, pow of the machine gun fire of, the, the stories you know and I, I wanted it to be like that I wanted it to just keep hitting because and I even mentioned in a, another interview how 
you know, you see me at the beginning of the book and then I kind of disappear about, you know, 20 pages into it. You know, I'm in the motel, right. I start working, I'm doing this because I tried to in interject more myself into it at some point in a narrative form. And it just got boring. Like everything I was doing in my personal life or whatever could have been, you know, exciting, but it was boring in comparison to in contrast to the the characters that were coming through the cab like they had way more drama than i did so i was just getting in the way i could totally see how i would be handicapping my own book by inter sure. introducing my own kind of you know goony stuff in well there. yeah i mean at that point what you're kind of doing is you are the camera right and so acknowledge that the camera is there but at the same time the story is not about the camera right i mean i don't see it as being that as a matter of fact several people have suggestions here alice suggested it uh julia suggested it. michelle suggested, suggested it. what read us read one of your favorite stories oh my god your, in your own voice i mean i'm not gonna read it for what you I, I think it's so boring when i read like i've tried this before and um let me see if I can find one. Just ask me another question while I kind of look through this. Um, I tell you one that I really liked. Uh, well, no, no, no. I don't want to do that because that's not the question. What they asked was one that you really like. I'm going to give you one that I like. So you figure out is there one in particular that stands out to you? Well, when people like getting into the book because it, it, I wanted it to look simple first of all. I wanted it to look not like like my albums. I didn't want it to be artsy fartsy. I wanted it to look like a bumblebee sitting on the bookshelf. Or a, or a cab, like I wanted to be simple and, and, and accessible, like right away. So, and just the story, the, the fact that it's cab driving, people probably will buy the book maybe if they, for the titillating stories, but the Trojan horse of the book is the actual heartfelt stories that you get in there. And once you're in with the drunks and the fun stuff, then I slip in the stuff that like sinks into your heart and the one i one of the ones i like is called heart calibration i haven't read it in a while but i'll i'll try to read it real quick if y'all want to hear it it's i tend to think this is so boring when i read but heart calibration pick up at the old people projects my passenger is a sweet old black man going to a charity hospital his bag is packed he appears nervous how are you doing I ask him, I'm not feeling too good right now, he says. I was like, what's wrong? He goes, my blood pressure's riding high, I'm dizzy. I wanna make sure I ain't dying. I'm like, okay, well, how come your wife isn't coming with you? And he says, she's gone, it's just me now. Everybody done died off. And at that moment, I feel my heart kind of twist in my chest. And I just, just see the essence of this old man and you know, I just for a few seconds, like you just get a glimpse, like the window pops open and then it's closed. So he and I continue the ride. We talk and roll through the night, eventually arriving at the hospital where I help him out of cab and he thanks me. I walk him into the hospital. His shirt is tucked into his jeans and he's got an industrious little shuffle to his walk. And a few little tears squeeze out of my eyes as I'm watching him walk away. Cause I'm in that little window where you get a brief peep at the humanity of strangers, which it's hard to keep that window open. That's when I've learned in the cab and throughout my life is you want to be connected to everybody, but God or the universe just pops that window open for short periods of time. And you just try to hang on to it, that connection. So I say in the book, sometimes when you're too wound up and consumed with your own bullshit, it's nice to have an experience that recalibrates your heart and reminds you that you are human. And it's as if for a few brief minutes, God, God lets you peek inside someone else's soul. You're never ready for it, it just happens and it sets you straight for a while. You forget all your own problems, they don't seem as big or stressful and you feel a strange kinship with your fellow humans because you realize that they are fragile and, poss and possibly broken just like you. That was a good one. I like that. One. I love that one. Actually. I wish they were all like that, but that's not, that wasn't the nature of the job. It was yeah. chaos. It was drunks. And, you know, uh, there's a couple of instances where there was violence. You know, I punched a guy in the nose and who's tried to put me in a headlock. Like, it was a lot of, like, I, did, I didn't see that guy's soul when he, he was trying to put me in a headlock. You are <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, yeah, it kind of has a tendency to probably have a hard time seeing that. But 
you in the book, you're only robbed once, correct me if I'm wrong, right? You know, Ran on a couple times. Ran, like that but, happens, that's more often. That's two but, or three but times. But like straight up robbed with yeah. a weapon yeah. one time. Was that the case? Gun uh, in my face, man. I've had that happen. Gun in my forehead. That's always interesting. What were you doing? Oh, long story. We don't, Boy, you we don't have time for that. Son. Okay, so <laughs> in the book, it's only once. Did it happen um, more than that? Or was it only one time? Just one time I got robbed, man. And you know, it wasn't in my early years. It was the last phase of the tablog. It was probably my last year doing it. Yeah. 2007 or 2008 so i was overconfident in my you know in my uh tactical aptitude right of the job you know i was confident like you just i got this shit like you can't pull shit on me and these dudes pulled some shit on me like they were kind of stalling and it was a little fishy but i kind of ignored it because it didn't wink on my radar too hard because my radar had already been through enough stuff and yeah. and we were in a dark ass little ghetto parking lot in an apartment complex that was tucked away back in the hood and they knew that they were smart actually and boom one of the guys pulled a gun put it to my head it wasn't cool yeah. and uh and it was a monday night i had 61 bucks in fares in my pocket i just reached in my right hand pocket where i kept the money i picked it up and i was like dude here it is take it it's yours and you know, they were all going off and yelling at me. Yeah, it's a jack, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's a jack, bro. Yeah. Give us the money. Where's the rest? And I was like, no, bro. Like, this is, it's a Monday night. 61 bucks. Do what you got to do. And right, right, right. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that I made that, remain that calm. But I'd also, also been doing the job for four, almost five years at that point. So I was kind of used to a lot of chaos. Probably got some PTSD from that, you know. Is, from, do you know why? Is it still a strictly cash business now? Do you know? I think they may have introduced credit cards, but at that time, you know, like smartphones weren't around 2003 to 2008, like people weren't smartphoning yet and they didn't, they, they didn't have the cab. Like Lafayette's small. It's a, it's a town of, you know, 110, 20,000 people. Right. So it doesn't have the big city infrastructure. Well, in town, but like in the book, when you're driving out of town, you know, it's much larger than that. I, mean, I got a, miles out. The guy that robbed me, here's another little story. All right. Five years later, I'm working after my tenure at the Independent. I'm uh -huh. working at the at the men's shelter. Uh -huh. The guy that robbed me came in. He was staying. He he, he was you he ended him? up in the shelter. I remembered him. And not only that, he came to my department, which is assessing doing assessment on guys on their financial oh, wow. um, thing uh, on their financial status. Like, do you have any money? Do you have disability? This and that. So he came into my office, and I recognized him because. I, there's a few just physical details that were like hard yeah you to don't mistake. forget somebody wrong <laughs> and you know what I, I knew it was him and we were looking he knew i was the guy like he or maybe he suspected something and he was really kind of reserved and i was like i'm gonna help this dude out yeah. and i helped him try to find wow. a job i made him a resume we got him hooked up i never said anything but uh, it's a weird little ribbon on the bow of the weirdness of that situation. Like that I was a weird. case manager in a home, men's homeless shelter for a couple of years. So, and the guy that robbed me came in. I, you know, I'm 99% sure that was him. Murph asked, did a lot of the rods end up in the hospital? You mean the passengers? Yeah. Like, God, no, you know, no, maybe. Were there are a lot of rides that ended at the hospital. You know what? Now that I'm thinking about it there were a lot of charity hospital trips and sometimes it was just like some guy would be like, I got a stomach ache and he'd want to go to the hospital. People are weird like that. Like I never go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor unless I've got like a bro. Unless my head is cracked open. Right. But the, there were a lot of them, like a lot of people going and it was always, Oh, usually to the charity hospital in town, yeah. you know, poor folks just trying to get their thing together, dude. And I get it. So uh who has somebody else i go who's somebody ask you to oh al asked if you would read this one the trey tour oh my god that's a long one man like i'm gonna tell the story how about i just tell the story real quick which will but it is a book that you published that i you know wrote, well so, i'm gonna use I the mean... book as a cheat sheet <laughs> because i mean it's really hard to read your own crap and like make it sound entertaining because i've gone to readings i've seen like some pretty badass I saw Leroy Jones, you know, and like some, some killer like poets do the thing. And it takes some talent to do that. I don't know if I have that. 
So the traitor, this is an entry where I picked up a guy. A traitor is a Cajun kind of medicine man, like a healer. And I picked up this guy at an apartment complex. He's in his kind of early 70s. He's dressed in a weird kind of suit that was more maybe from the 1970s. It was, he looked like a salesman, like selling vacuum cleaners, like from an old movie. His name was Fred Roy. A buddy of mine in town named Colby Foreman can verify for it, this for me because Colby lived in the same apartment complex. And uh, so we took a ride. You really want me to read this? Do it. Okay. So he, this guy pops in the cab. He seems interesting. He goes, my name is Fred Roy. I'm like, I noticed right away there's something weird about him, but it's a cool, harmless weird. He talks about casinos and gambling. And he wants to go gambling tonight, but he isn't sure if he can afford the cab fare to the casino, which are, you know, 20 minutes out of town. And his brain kind of skips around with a, like a broken record. Like out of nowhere, he's just like, where's Canton? You ever been to Canton? I like Canton, which is a town around here. I got Ken there. I'm like, dude, uh, um, I nod, you know, just kind of like, okay, dude, we, are, we arrive at a restaurant, which is where he wants to go. And as we get there, he's like, I like to gamble, but I can't afford it. Okay, man. Um, I drop him off the restaurant. He calls for me back. You can do that at the cab. You're like, hey, call the cab company back. Say the driver that dropped me off. Can you send him to come pick me up? It's kind of like a little courtesy, you know, they can do because you get, you know, another ride. So I go back to pick him up and, uh, I ask him if he wants to go gambling, dude. He's like, no, I don't want to go gambling right now. I don't want to go to Kington. I'm like, okay, which is where the casino is. While we're in the cab, I call my buddy Colby just to see, like, I think Ra uh, Fred Roy, the pastor, was just kind of babbling. I was like, Colby, who's this guy, Fred Roy? He lives in your apartment complex. Oh, it's Fred's cool. Fred's cool, man. He's a traitor, dude. I was like, what? He's a traitor. Yeah, check him out. So I hang out with Colby. And, uh, as I'm actually, as, as I'm on the phone with Colby, I, it's hard to explain. So Fred's a traitor, long story short, I bring Fred back to his house and I'm like, Fred, I hear you're a traitor. Can you do some, uh, would you be opposed to doing a little kind of zapping on me, like a little faith healing, you know? Cause I got some wounds. I mean, I don't talk about it publicly a lot, but you know, I've been through some crap. You know? And I figure this can't hurt because I'm, I'm open to that stuff. I'm, I'm not a cynic about it. I don't think we know everything. So Fred Roy actually goes in the house, comes out. I think he brings out like a cross or a rosary. And he puts his hands on me through the cab on, on my shoulders and says, uh, you know, he starts kind of mumbling quietly and praying or something. I don't know what he's doing, but I kind of feel something like there's an energy that happens. But in the book, I totally exaggerate it and I kind of riff on it like, oh, it's Tuscan cool and like, you know, O-rings of light pop out of my mind. And, I, and then I kind of pull that back and I'm like, OK, I'm just joking. But I did feel something. I just don't know what it was. And I don't know if it was strong enough to actually kind of write about. But nonetheless, Fred Roy put a zapping on me, man. And you know what? There was a thing that I was kind of directing at Fred Roy that he fixed in me. The traitor, so true story. And I won't talk about that, but he did help me get through some stuff. Why won't you talk about that? Everyone, inquiring minds want to know. They do? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, mean, what else are we doing? I mean, I'm a musician, man. Like an occupational hazard of musicians is a certain addiction component. Like you're around drugs and all these things all the time. And I was definitely out of that that realm i'd already done my drugs in my 20s and experimented with it and got my ass kicked but there's a still a little residue in the back of your mind that hangs on and you you might well maybe i was kind of apt to maybe kind of like mm -hmm. leaning on that for a little bit you know occasionally right. and that's kind of and dude after that fred roy episode zap it didn't happen right away but like it cleared out it cleared that shit out of my life I tell you what's interesting, man. I had a when we, we were talking, you and I were talking before this interview talk about the faith healer that I had interviewed. Yeah. 
um i had kind of the same experience where something happened and i wrote about it and tried to explain it and it was weird because you caught a lot i caught a lot of flack from people like emailing me like oh this hoodoo nonsense and blah 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 and it was still really strange like i had a really hard time even trying to write about it because it is it's emotional because you're not sure exactly even what it is right yeah and so it's unquantifiable right it's the x variable it could be just the energy between humans that's right. elevating us, the right, higher right. power. Like, that's why I get, um, I don't know, annoyed maybe with people that are sure, like there's no God or atheism. I don't know. Yeah, right. But there's there's an energy between humans that will elevate us. And as such as now, not to get into politics, but things are so polarized now. Like, you can feel our collective energy hum is low. Yeah. And almost like grunt level, like battle cries. In um, The Scorned Woman, you've got this great line where you said, I sit and listen to her talk. Sometimes that is the only thing you can do for people. Just give them your silence and listen. Did you ever get the feeling that you were, uh, sometimes I feel like you're, it's almost like you're a, 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 like a therapist just kind of hauling people around do you totally. get that sense like we're all each other's therapists like your relationship partner your son or daughter your friends like we're all here to listen to each other man and, and that's a gift that you give to people like without trying to interject too much of your own thing into their life or correct them like giving people your silence and listening to them and them trusting you enough to to share that with you is a big deal like, I, I mean, I got the buddies that I share really deep stuff with, married guys, dudes that have been around the block that have a certain maturity level to them. I can count them on one hand, less like half of one hand. Like, it's got to be a certain kind of person I'm going to confide in. I'm not going to do that with like my rangy buddies and stuff like that. Like, so something about the cab created a little, the anonymity created a, an intimacy that people would sometimes share, overshare maybe with. You know, just getting it out, voicing this problem that they'd have or problems, you know, like talking about it. Like there's something obviously therapeutic about it. So. Yeah. All right, let's see what else. What other questions do we have here? Uh, oh, oh, Murph's good question to get. Did any of these rides or being a cab driver ever make it into any of your songs, in your songwriting? You know what? I get people asking me that a lot. They're always, when I, sometimes I'll post road logs and they're like, man, that'll make a good song. With me, it's almost, and I'm really lucky in the sense, I have two forms of, uh, two of these creative outlets writing wise. Like songs to me are more dreamy. Like uh, it's almost like superimposed photographs on top of one another that that's not so narrative. Like it, it's more like sometimes you're, you're just like T-Rex saying, wham, bam, telegram, Sam, and it sounds good. And it fits with the chords. And sometimes that means more than, you know, reciting the lyrics to the wreck of the Edmonds Fitzgerald or whatever it is. Um, so I kind of separate the two. I think it informs it maybe in a, in a, in a backgroundy life sense or a, a scenic scenery sense, because I know this area I'm so intimately connected to Louisiana and the backdrop of the Deep South. But I don't write about specifically uh, in narrative form and song a lot. And that's actually what I enjoy about doing nonfiction writing or even fiction is like I'm actually getting to stretch out and kind of not having to make things rhyme, not having to make it melodically interesting as well, which is, a, you know, songs are like a weird Rubik's Cube that you're trying to dial in. Whereas in the literary writing, I can stretch out in a different way, which I like to do that's different than the songs to me. And it's a different outlet that I enjoy. Francesca wants to know what you're eating. These are like, this is a nut mix. It's like some nuts from the local like Whole Foods store. Eating nuts like a squirrel. I'm trying to eat better, you know? Hey. I was totally raised on like hamburger helper and corn dogs. <laughs> But I don't know why they call it hamburger helper. It's fine by itself. Manwich. So <laughs> just some nuts, bag of nuts. Hey, so Elizabeth says people make up the place after uh, driving people around for five years. Did you learn anything new or surprising about Lafayette? It can be a weird little place. I think it's an understatement. 
but I think she, her point's dead on. Like, what did you learn aside from these kind of small vignettes? Is there any kind of like overall, or is there something in particular like, huh, I had no idea that dude was that dude, or, um, or maybe even big takeaway, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think I say in the book is how much. I knew uh, people assume you're going to learn so much more about people, but you end up learning a lot about yourself, which I did too. Like I kind of, you're not tested in, until you're in the trenches with people. You know, you might think of yourself as like, oh, I'm all zen out and like everything's cool. And like, hey, I, I love you, man. And, but until you're faced with really difficult situations and you're having to really kind of moderate your reaction to them in an authentic way, you're not tested, you know, like it's tough. And I thought it was maybe like a 7.5 on the spiritual scale of like enlightened dudes. And when I, when actuality, I was probably like a 4.9, like I'm an asshole too, dude, I'm fucked up. So I realized that, but the thing about Lafayette and people, I think the addiction factor to answer your question is like, wow, like drugs are really widespread. And I'm not like some like, um, spring chicken. That's like, Oh, drugs are wild. You know, like, Right. Like I'd already done my time messing around, experimenting with that stuff. So, uh, but I was, even I was surprised at the demographics of people that use drugs get completely obliterated on alcohol. That's not, that's a, that to me, that's probably one of the worst drugs. Like crack and alcohol are really bad. Like, and people that have problems with them really like face some challenging circumstances. So I was just amazed at the amount of uh, addiction, the, the level of addiction that comes out at night normal people and whatever like this the whole rainbow of humanity it's so fascinating to think about i'm wondering why it's a night thing you know like is it just basically easier to hide at night you know is it easier yeah, people like, go to sleep dude yeah. and you get just like i mean I, there were so many people like and i, I touch on this in the cab like just guy guys would get in the cab and it's like where are the girls right and that means where are the prostitutes? Not like where are the chicks hanging out? It means like drive me to a section of the city where prostitutes walk the streets, and I can. And you're pick one up. and you're supposed to basically intuitively know that lingo. Like when they're getting in a cab, is there like the understanding? Like you're supposed to know I mean, this. Nobody schooled me on that, but you eventually start yeah, figuring, yeah. sussing right. it out. Like okay, um, this is what they want. Okay, this is what's happening here. One of the things uh, we're talking about music a second ago, and you're saying it wasn't, you know, the experiences are not necessarily directly involved, but tell me about, I don't want to go too far into this because it, but I find it interesting, Trailerville. How, how does Trailerville kind of play into this whole thing? Um, because that's kind of, uh, it's a, it's a record that Deej released uh, his, by himself before he kind of went, started doing his own solo thing between Santa Rita, right? Yeah. And it's it's kind of a departure for you, man. But I gotta tell yeah. you, I love that record. It's so it's so <laughs> hypnotic and it's a good house cleaning record, man. <laughs> you put it on the background, you clean your whole house. Right. Well, I mean I I do work to it sometimes, you know. And so tell me about that record in the context of this book. How did the how did uh, did they inform each other at all? Because I could see how they might maybe so. Um the record trailer bill when I, I was living in the motel, but after like, you know, 10, 12 months of working in the cab, I made, I had saved enough money to rent a trailer and really cheap too. Like this cheap ass trailer, not far from here. I moved in the trailer and then there was a whole nother uh, subculture of people living in this giant trailer park, this area of Scott, Louisiana. It was just like hundreds of like 800 trailers out there. And kind of what was formerly maybe a uh, uh, just a field to, to yeah. plant crops, like a crop, uh, not crawfish, but rice field. Crawfish. Right. Yeah. Right. That they just turned into trailer park. So they had an atmospheric thing. Also, I, I was kind of proud of myself. This sounds ridiculous, but this is totally a southern thing. But like, hey man, I got my own place, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a two hundred twenty five dollar month trailer, but I like. I'm kicking ass, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was cool. There was a cool peacefulness there. That peacefulness actually gave me a little um, uh, distance from the chaos of the cab so I could actually write about it. So they kind of funneled one another. I ended up recording a record in the trailer park that was improvisational and totally instrumental. And uh, I whittled that down to 12 songs and put that out. 
What was it recorded? It was on? actually my neighbor. I had a neighbor named Captain Fruitcake. <laughs> <laughs> no bullshit. I mean, fr- his name is Frank, but we called him Captain Fruitcake. His mother did not name him. Captain he was a Fruitcake. deadhead, right? He was an older deadhead guy. Right. He looked like a hell's angel. And he heard me playing guitar at night. And he was like, dude, let me record what you're doing and just make a tape of it. And so he had a mini disc recorder. He set it up in my apartment. He goes, whenever you play and practice, just press record. So I did it. In four days, oh, wow. he, had 40, he had four CDs worth of music. Oh, wow. And we whittled it down to one thing. You know, He's still out there. Frank, I think he lives in Oklahoma or somewhere as now. He messaged me the other day on Facebook. So if anybody's got any more questions, we only have about eight, nine minutes left. But uh, Francesco's got, uh, post them in the chat. Francesco's got another good question. And we can keep it going if y'all want. It kind of goes back to the road log uh, idea. He's asking, like, so where do you, uh, how does all this get started? I mean, writing about something in your life in that particular moment. Was it basically just like, I'm out on the road, I'm seeing all this crazy stuff and nobody's going to believe. I just got to write it down. Or was it just sort of like, this is what I'm doing to kind of stay grounded? why because you start i find it interesting you start doing this i mean it's for the internet i mean it is i'm, I'm broadcasting this right it wasn't yeah. like you're just writing in a journal but i was doing that previously like uh, right. pretty much since i guess about the age of 18 i was journaling i was keeping journals i still have these journals too by the way and they're probably awful i don't want to read them yeah, sure. but i do have them stashed at my mom's right so I'd already gotten the habit of that. It's it's the same way people that are artistically gifted that draw and sketch. I, I'm not good at drawing. I can't draw with a shit, but I've always written about things. It's just a little compulsion that I do. And I've always done it. I didn't think I was ever good at it. I didn't consider myself a writer, quote unquote, right. until I published the catalog thing in the independent. I was like, okay, now I could I feel okay about calling myself a writer. What was the other thing that you did? It just reminded me of the, uh, the one that I love so much. The um, Oh, Fighting Spam with Ham. What about that, the homeless one, man? I enjoyed the homeless one, but the Fighting the, fighting the Spam with Ham was great because Deej basically got hooked a um, Nigerian, a Nigerian prince who was basically trying to get him <laughs> to send him some money. Deej was able to communicate with him at length. And there was a great exchange. Do you still have that posted? Is that somewhere online? I do. It's online. You got to dig around. It was great. It was like Ignatius Riley was like talking to the Nigerian prince about where he was going to. You know, Pretty much those Nigerian scams that were popping off in the early 2000, mid 2000s. I tried to scam that guy and I kept a, a record of our correspondence and published that as a feature article. A couple of years after the catalog, the initial catalog article. There was another thing. So and another thing that you in talked, the independent, you know, another article they wrote were uh, talk about that one with the homeless population. Were you working at the homeless shelter at that time? No, or no. Did you get it after? How did I? I don't remember how. how that piece came probably got me the job at the homeless shelter, though. Right. Okay, so after Katrina, Hurricane Katrina and Rita, which affected Louisiana in two thousand five. Yeah. In the wake of that. There was a lot of people that moved to Lafayette and Lafayette had this chitter chatter going on like, oh, there's a lot of homeless people. They're all from New Orleans. There was all this kind of kind of I don't know how to describe it. It was more prejudice than racial. It was just kind of just small towns getting kind of threatened. It was an awful. Vibe. And I was like, I want to go find out if who, who's out there. So I ended up putting like, I think, 20 bucks in my pocket, packing a backpack. And I lived on the streets homeless in Lafayette. I had my beard grown out at the time. So I looked pretty homeless. I can I can pull that look off. So I went lived with the homeless guys for a week and I just wrote it and took notes. And and I told them what I was doing. I didn't fake what I was. I was like, hey man, I'm a reporter. I'm like, uh, I'm gonna write about this stuff and I wanna know what your experience is. The funny thing was they didn't believe me. They thought I was just homeless guy with the, like I was trying to scam, like I was crazy. And it's like, ah, oh, this guy thinks he's a journalist. He's fucking cooked out, you know, cause everybody's crazy on the street. Right, right, right? Right. So I really like, until I brought out a tape recorder, like a digital recorder and like started recording the conversations, they didn't believe that I was actually writing a writer. So I did that and I did that, lived in a hobo camp on right. the north side of town, wrote about the whole thing. And that was another story that people really liked. And it was fun. I slept under a bridge, slept in the hobo camp. You know, and I just wrote about their lives. I think one of the ladies that you interviewed for that story ended up getting a job somewhere in town because I, re- I and it was interesting. I was at a store once and uh, I was like, man, that lady looks really, really familiar. 
And it was one of those things where I couldn't place her. And like days went by, I was like, that's one really? of the women that uh, Deej interviewed. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where was this at? Where'd she get a job? Uh, it was a hardware <laughs> store. I can't remember which one. That's it was. not a bad gig. No, going from the streets to the yeah, hardware I, store. I, All right, exactly. But it's uh, possible. And these people are more like well, the, the the interesting thing about the homeless population was they weren't all like lifetime hobo homeless people. There's a couple like rangy uh, traveler guys that were lifetime hobos, gypsy pirates. But a lot of them had just experienced something really debilitating. For example, some of these son died and it just crushed him and then he turned to the alcohol and that kind of fucked up his life and it just went on from there but i did so that's the so then that parlayed into your job at working at the homeless shelter right i mean you i was this. actually doing the cab thing and i did the homeless thing at the same time wow <laughs> so i mean i was already dealing with people on the homeless level and the cab sometimes you see them and they just want to ride and you kind of like cut it's called a cut under right. the radar you know right, right. Help people out Joe Youssef, if you're out there, I love you, buddy. That's my old boss. But I cut a few calls just to help people out, you know? To um, one other quick question. This, I don't know if you had any thoughts about this at all, but as I was reading this, you know, it, it, it's not that long ago. It's not that far in the distant past. But yeah. I, I, I started thinking, man, is this still is this still the nighttime world here in Lafayette? Are you aware? Does Uber, does Lyft, do all these things change that vibe? I've talked to Uber drivers about this because I'll get in. I'll I kind of mention, hey, I used to drive a cab. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 difference between then and now is now they have everybody's information. Like an Uber driver has knows who you are, what your credit card information is. Like you can't pull no crazy shit. Right, right, like, right. You right. know, you could do it, but you're going to end up getting fucked, right, real fast. Like right. you can't run, you can't rob the guy. So when I did the cab and the cab situation where it was all cash, you didn't know who was in there. Sometimes even the guys that would rob you, they would call from a pay phone or some kind of one of their friend's phones or something so they could cloak it. So it was still Wild West back then, you know? Maybe it's even like that now, but it, it was wild. Like, Uber is way more civilized. Right. Like, you're, there's a lot of protective security within that realm. Like, nobody with a sex charge or whatever can drive. Do you have any idea for the guy, are the guys, are you, are you still staying in contact with any guys that are still driving cabs? I don't. I was, I don't. I was They've all wonder, disappeared, man. I wonder how it affects the business. I wonder if it affects it. Because part of me says that that's got to be cutting into the business. But another part of me says there's people out there without smartphones that still need to get around. Yeah, it's definitely cutting into the business. Man. Yeah. It's just a new world. It's like, you know, it's like the music industry getting right streamlined with streaming and stuff it's just the same thing with the publishing industry and books sure, you know sure, i'm yeah. so stoked that people still want to read books and and I, honestly i think the literacy rate has dropped a lot just because of cell phones like people want to read and, and be engaged and don't want to miss out what's out there so i think people are learning to read out of necessity of just being in the game here's a wild card question what's the first song you ever wrote and would you play it now no way <laughs> it was really bad as they all are when you first start out because I, I never took i took one guitar lesson that was it so i had to teach myself and it was horrible so i would never do that but i made one day but not here and uh you talked about this a second ago um i, I love this line in uh, uh, xmas and retrograde where you said uh no, you didn't say this directly, but you know how people are so divisive now. You said, no one is thinking about the gentle heart of the sleeping baby Jesus as they careen demented and temporarily insane through yellow lights and congested intersections. Um, is that still the case here in Lafayette? I think so, man. I mean, this, there's a weird thing that happens during Christmas time. It's like joyous, the baby Jesus, miles of top, all the other stuff. But people and they're taking care of their families and they're buying all these gifts but it's a high stress time yeah. and this entry that he's referring to i'm talking about how cold-hearted motherfuckers are in traffic like you know your uh soccer mom in her minivan is cutting you off she's not letting you merge or do anything like it's it's gladiator style dickheadishness man <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it, but it, it's real. And you will, and everybody feels it. Like if you pay attention, like motherfuckers are ruthless out there during holiday time. It's about to hit now. It's coming up. So for a lot of folks who, um, 
who've gotten the book and had a chance to read it, you know, this is kind of all new for them. This is in some ways kind of old hat for you. I mean, it's kind of the end of a journey in one way. Big time. What's the next step? What are you doing next? First off, I'm like, I wrote this thing 10 years ago, the, the catalog book, and I revised it over the past 10 years. Like revising is like, that's part of the work of doing it. Like you have to reread and kind of critique yourself, get others to critique you. So I'm glad it's out there. I really am. And I'm so totally stoked that people are reading this and, and, and interested. I think I want to do a, a, a series of log books. And the next one would be Road Log, which is the other series that I kind of do online, which is about my experiences in touring bands. And I started doing that in 2000, which is 20 years of touring experiences, like starting in 2000. This was published online, some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not out there anymore, but I've got, I've got word files of all this stuff. So I would, it would have probably, Road Log would be, will be probably split into two books, hopefully or a badass one book, but that's the next in the series. I want to do the road log and musicians are just as kooky as cab passengers, man. They're, they're nuts. And I'm not talking about like the majority of the road logs aren't me like, Hey man, we played the gig. It kicked ass. We rocked the city, man. People loved us. No, it's the shit that happens in between the gigs where dudes are kind of tweaking out. They're kooky. They're drunk. They're depressed. They're in some cases, um, Paranoid schizophrenics, like one of the my good buddies, I love him to death, but one of our uh, ex Santa Maria members was, he really thought the CIA and the FBI was following us around. Like that's, this is some interesting stories. So I have a shit ton of those and that'll probably be the next book. That That's that's what I'm working on. Unless something else would pop up and you know, it could happen. Like COVID's kooky right now. The pandemic's got everything kind of I'll scramble. And, and I'm not just doing this book because of the pandemic. I've always done the writing and the music at the same time. And I honestly believe I'm a pretty good musician, but I'm more, I think I'm more, this is my own opinion. I think I'm more naturally talented of a writer than I am a musician. Like I can't go jump in with the, with the meters and the Noble Brothers and jam like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I'm just, I, I'm my own little kooky songwriter guy, like a Nick Drake, but I have more of a natural talent for the writing thing. I'll tell you what, so Al has asked uh, that you read Fanfare for us. Come on, man. Yeah, come on, do it. You got come it. Come on. Well, you signed up for it. Hey, y'all want me to bar y'all to death, all right? <laughs> this is called Fanfare, page 151 of the Kablinic Bible, if you're following on this. Rainy night on the night shift, I fly down the alleyways in Buckland Boulevards as the rain sizzles upon the pavement and the tilted masts of the power lines slant like sinking ships. Accelerating block after block, ghetto to ghetto, I sweep past strobe lights and street lights as the police sirens sing out, echoing above, burnt bulbs, billboards, and neon bathed in the barbed wire skyline, feeding us the false hope to dream and delude ourselves for another payday like a fanfare of things that have come before us, but may never come again. <laughs> I don't know, so, I don't know if that's deep or not, man, but you know, I'm it. just like, I'm like, I'm really, I'm trying to muse into the thing. Like, um, like a lot of these catalogs, some of the, some of the entries are totally like bare bones. Like this guy's drunk, this guy's doing these things, but you'll see there's prose excursions where I'm going off off grid where I'm trying to divine what the human condition is in this particular instance. You know, I think that's the secret of the book. Like, it's not just like, oh, it's crazy cab stories. People get drunk and fucked up. There's some X variable heart, spiritual soul in it, I think. I think it lies at the heart of heart calibration when you write, as you've already said tonight, sometimes when you're too wound up and consumed with your own bullshit, it's nice to have an experience that recalibrates your heart. It reminds you that you are human. It's as if for a few brief minutes, God lets you peek inside someone else's soul. I appreciate you letting us do that tonight. I appreciate the folks who uh, decided to join us and uh, ask questions here. Um, 
And we're going to throw it back to uh, the Garden District Bookshop, where they're going to tell us how to get the book. Yes, sir. All right. Great conversation there. Loved hearing the stories and uh, getting into that mind of Dej there. Uh, and I'll post the link again, uh, people to purchase the book. Let's see right here. There we go. There's the link. Uh, we appreciate your business, and especially in these times. Anybody got any other questions? Yeah, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask another question, uh, feel free. There we go. That's a, that great book cover. It's like a bumblebee. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I don't take none of it for granted, man. Garden District Books, thank you, guys. Let's chit chat on email about stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, bro.